The Finding Holy podcast is where Ashley Hales sits down with authors, pastors, activists, and artists to help you connect the dots between the things that really matter and your everyday holy life. And you'll get to hear everyone's laundry routines. To listen to the Finding Holy podcast, go to aahales.com slash podcast or wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by The Table Podcast from Dallas Theological Seminary. How can you and your church think more biblically about issues facing our culture? How can we better engage those who see Christianity differently? Join us for The Table Podcast as we discuss issues of God and culture at dts.edu slash the table. We're in the middle of a season that explores the rise of Christian fundamentalism through the life of William Jennings Bryan. So far, it's been a lot of fun. As part of that, I released an episode about Brian's crusade to shift from the gold standard to one that also included silver. You may want to go back and listen to that one before you listen to this. For that episode, I interviewed one of my radio heroes, Jacob Goldstein. His book is Money, the True Story of a Made-Up Thing. He's also a co-host of NPR's Planet Money podcast and an executive producer of Pushkin Industries. He and I had a fascinating talk that didn't make it into the episode because it's neither about fundamentalism or William Jennings Bryan. In fact, he died four years before this thing happened. Of course, I'm talking about the Great Depression. But since the story is so interesting, I wanted to include it here as a bonus. So in 1929, at the start of the crisis, the U.S. was still on the gold standard. Not gold and silver, just gold. And as it turns out, this seemingly innocuous concept that my paper and coin money is worth a fixed amount of gold made the Great Depression much, much worse. Okay, here is my conversation with Jacob Goldstein. That gets us into the Great Depression and where the gold standard is really put to the test. Uh, How does the gold standard kind of exacerbate the Great Depression? Before I started covering money, studying money, learning about money, I think I, I, you know, I didn't think about the depression that much. I knew about the crash, right? The stock market crash of 29. And I sort of thought, oh, that was the problem. There was this stock market crash. And as a result, we had a depression. But that's really just not true. Uh, the stock market crash on its own would have been enough to cause, you know, a recession, a downturn. But ultimately, it was the gold standard that turned that recession into the Great Depression. The 1920s were this booming period of speculation and growth in the United States. Think the Great Gatsby. Then comes 1929, and things are looking bad prices start to fall. As we discussed in the last episode, when prices fall, it gets harder for people to pay their debts. They have to work harder to make the same bills. If I take out a loan with a payment of $100 a month and I have to sell 50 tacos to make that payment, that sounds reasonable. But if the cost of goods drops and I have to cut my prices to stay competitive, I now have to sell twice as many tacos just to make my payment. I'm working harder to pay the same debt. It's getting harder and harder for people to pay their debts. They start defaulting on their loans, right? People are are losing their jobs or if they get a job, their wages are lower. Prices are falling. Wages are falling. People are defaulting on their loans. In places where lots of people default, banks start going under. Because when lots of people don't pay their loans, the bank that made those loans goes belly up. Today, in America and any developed country, when lots of people lose their jobs and prices start to fall or look like they might start to fall, every central bank does the same thing. They essentially put more money out into the world in order to push prices back up in order to uh, make it cheaper for people to borrow money. Doing those things fights this problem. The goal was to try to push prices back up. You want the cost of goods to grow. That way, I don't have to sell as many tacos to pay back my loan. 
the way you fight that problem is you start to push prices back up. You end the fall in prices. And the way you fight falling prices is you put more money into the world. But like the whole point of the gold standard, sort of, is the government cannot just put more money out into the world because it's tied to gold, right? So the gold standard prevents the government from putting more money into the world. If you want to go one step further, you know, by this time, there is a central bank in the United States, the Federal Reserve, the same central bank we have today. But at this time, its job is really different, right? Its job is sort of managing the gold standard. And so at this moment, when people are getting nervous, right? Banks are failing. People are losing their money. There's no deposit insurance yet. People are not only starting to pull their money out of the banks, but this is still the time when it's the gold standard. You can trade paper money for gold. So people are going to Federal Reserve banks and trading their paper money for gold. They were supposed to be able to walk up to the bank window, hand them their paper and coins, and receive the equivalent amount of gold from their local bank. There is just one problem. Banks didn't have that kind of gold on hand. You saw this in It's a Wonderful Life when George Bailey is trying to rescue the savings and loan from a bank run. He tells them, essentially, that your money isn't here. It's in your house, and in your house, and in your house. Banks make their income not really by holding money, but by investing those assets in things like houses, cars, and businesses. The money isn't just sitting in the vault. That means, of course, that if the bank has only 30% of their assets on hand, they don't need 100% of their clients to come in and demand their money back in order to go out of business. They only need 30%. They have to protect their money or they're sunk. So somehow they have to incentivize people to leave it in the banks. Now, there is a move you can make under the gold standard if you are a central bank and people are trying to trade in their paper dollars for gold. And that move is you raise interest rates, right? You raise interest rates because that makes it more worthwhile for people to leave their money in the bank and not uh, take out their money as paper money and not turn their money into gold. Right, because that means if you leave your money in the bank, you will get more interest. It will accrue more interest. So it's attractive exactly right. rather than like running in and having a run on the bank and, uh, and people pulling their money out. They're leaving it in there under the promise that I'll get more money if I just let it sit. Exactly right. And you know, at, at the margin, right, this is all sort of thinking at the margin. If you're really scared, whether you're getting 3% interest or 5% interest or whatever, you'll pull your money out. But there's lots of activity at the margin. Lots of people are like kind of on the fence. And if interest rates go up a little, they'll leave their money in a little longer. Like that part is reasonable enough. The problem is raising interest rates is the opposite of what you want to do when the economy is shutting down and prices are falling. Because in addition to making it you know, more attractive for people to leave money in their savings account, it makes it less attractive for people to borrow money, right? It makes it harder for people who need to refinance those loans that are suddenly so onerous because of deflation. It makes it harder for businesses that are about to go out of business to borrow a little more money and stay afloat. So it's effectively exactly the opposite of what a central bank should be doing when the economy is collapsing, right? When the economy goes down now, the central bank lowers interest rates to make it easier for people to borrow and spend and keep the economy going. So by following the sort of rules of the gold standard, the Fed, the central bank, is making the economy way worse. And it is, in fact, this raising interest rates that accelerates the collapse, crashes the economy, causes more bank runs, more bank failures, more falling prices. And then we're locked into this spiral of falling prices, uh, bankruptcies, bank failures, more falling prices, just going down and down and down. In order to keep people from running on the banks, the Federal Reserve did the exact wrong thing for the economy. It raised interest rates, which essentially slowed the economy down because fewer people could borrow money to start a business or buy stuff, and those already holding loans couldn't refinance because that would mean paying even more interest. This version of the Great Depression, this story, is like pretty much widely accepted among economists. Like it's not like a controversial or weird reading. You know, it was Milton Friedman came up with it. Like I feel like today we sort of think of the gold standards like, oh, well, conservatives like the gold standard. But Milton Friedman, probably the most famous conservative, certainly the most famous American conservative economist of the 20th century, he was the one who really like did all the math and 
studied incredibly extensively exactly what the Fed did, you know, every week, basically, and wrote this giant book of sort of monetary history and convinced essentially the entire economics world that, yes, in fact, the gold standard and the Fed caused the Great Depression. I think maybe the last piece for me that I have been curious about is why people want to go back. Is it just simply the nostalgia, the idea that this much gold buys me this many dollars? What What is the attraction? Well, I think there's a couple ways to think about it. I mean, a lot of people don't trust the government and the government now basically controls money entirely, which is an incredible power, right? And so if you're wary of government power, the gold standard seems like an appealing way to limit the power the government has over money. Is there something else? I mean, if I were going to reach, like, you know, maybe this is too far, but, you know, an interesting thing to me about gold is it's it's real. It's a physical thing in the world. You know, it, it's created like when neutron stars collide, apparently, it's an element. It's older than the Earth. It existed before there were people. It'll exist after there are people. And so when you think of money as gold, you can picture it. You know it's real. It's not some strange Wall Street creation. And I feel like that has a certain appeal, right? I feel like we want to think of money as a thing in the world. It's, it feels more straightforward that way. Importantly, I think Money is not that, and it has never really been that or been about that. I think even on the gold standard, you know, the moneyness of gold is this social thing that is sort of mediated by the government and by banks and that we're all kind of figuring out as we go. So I think maybe part of the allure of the gold standard is this desire to believe that money is a real physical thing in the world like gold, but it's not. Because regardless of what we choose money is going to be, it's going to be a matter of trust or faith, whether it's gold that's the standard or silver or tacos or broccoli, it's going to require faith or trust either way. Yes, absolutely. And and in fact, it's the faith or trust that that makes it money, right? Like gold is just rocks, like literally just like, you know, it's literally just rocks. And today, really, like we think of paper as money, but most money isn't paper, right? Most money is just numbers on a computer, essentially, right? You get paid in direct deposit and like the numbers you see when you look at your bank account on your phone go up. And, you know, really the trust today is fundamentally in in the country, right? The money operates at the at the level of the nation today, or in Europe in the case of, of the euro. But like the dollar is really trust in America as a growing concern, right? Certainly trust in the government, but trust in the American economy, right? Trust that America is going to keep functioning as a society and as an economy. And that's really where the trust is today, which frankly seems reasonable, right? Like, I mean, that's kind of what we got. That's kind of where we are right now. And so it makes sense that that's what what money is right now. Special thanks this week to the fantastic Jacob Goldstein. His book is Money, the True Story of a Made-Up Thing. He's also the co-host of NPR's Planet Money podcast and an executive producer of Pushkin Industries. This show is listener-supported. Become a patron for as little as $5 a month, and you'll get access to bonus episodes, patron-only conversations, and a whole bunch of other cool stuff, including more audio with Jacob that I couldn't fit into these episodes. It's your chance to hear what it's really like when I talk to somebody I'm a fanboy of. Your gifts make this show possible. Visit patreon.com slash trucepodcast to learn more. God willing, we'll be back soon with a new episode. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. And if you did, I'd like to also invite you over to the Finding Holy podcast, where Ashley Hales sits down with authors, pastors, activists, and artists to help you connect the dots between things that really matter in issues of faith and your everyday holy life. You'll even get to hear about the laundry routines. Go to aahales.com slash podcast or listen to the Finding Holy podcast wherever you choose to listen to your shows.